On April 16, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. penned an open letter that would become a key catalyst in the civil rights movement. It was powerful not just because of the words. It was powerful because of the circumstances in which it was written. Dr. King wrote that letter from a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama. Responding to critics who questioned his timing and his tactics, Dr. King said this, there was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Question, are you a thermometer or are you a thermostat? Are you reflecting the attitudes and opinions of those around you? Or are you shifting the atmosphere with faith, hope, and love? Let me ask it this way. What percentage of your thoughts, words, and actions are a regurgitation of the news you're watching and the social media you're consuming? And what percentage is a revelation that you are getting from God's word? Welcome to this six-part study on a book of the Bible that we call Philippians. The audience is the church in Philippi, but Paul is writing this letter from a jail cell. That is part of what makes this message so powerful. It's one thing to write about joy. It's another thing to do it while you're in prison, on trial, chained to Roman centurions. Over the next six sessions, we'll unpack this book chapter by chapter, and in some cases, verse by verse. What I wanna do in session one is set the scene. And this is significant. If content is king, then context is queen. There's a very simple principle in hermeneutics, the science of interpreting scripture, text, without context is pretext. In Judaism, there is a hermeneutic called pardes. It consists of four levels of learning, four stages of study. Level one is peshat. It's the plain reading of scripture. It's reading the Bible devotionally. You don't need a seminary degree to hear the still small voice of the Spirit. That said, Peshat is like the tip of the iceberg. It's the 13% that's above water. We're gonna dive a little deeper than that. Now, level two of study is called Ramez, and it literally means hint. It's the cues and the clues within the text. According to rabbinic tradition, every word of scripture has 70 faces and 600,000 meanings. Ramez is turning the kaleidoscope to reveal different facets of truth. The third level is called Duresh, and it means search as in Google search. Duresh is connecting the dots between the Torah and the Sermon on the Mount. It's connecting the dots between the Old Testament prophecies and New Testament fulfillments. It's letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Now, the fourth and final level is called Sod, and it means secret. This is where we need the help of the Holy Spirit. All scripture is God-breathed. The same spirit who inspired the writers to write helps readers read. And I might add, we don't just read the Bible. The Bible reads us. The spirit of God works on both sides of that equation. The goal isn't getting through scripture. The goal is getting scripture through us. So in session one, 
We will set the scene by connecting the dots. Paul is writing this letter to a people, to a church that he is intimately acquainted with. It's been a few years, but there are memories embedded in Paul's mind, in Paul's heart. As he writes this letter, he is seeing people's faces. He is having flashbacks to moments and miracles that they shared together. Ready or not, here we go. Philippians chapter one, verses one and two. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is some difference of opinion as to when and where Paul writes this letter. Best guess, Paul is writing from a prison cell in Rome, somewhere around 60 to 62 AD. Now, I've been to one of the sites where Paul is purported to have been imprisoned. It's about the last place you want to be. And Paul is not just on trial. It is life or death. Paul is living on borrowed time. Paul is writing with a holy urgency, and you can feel it when you read this letter. So, there is some difference of opinion as to when and where this letter is written, but we know who Paul is writing to. He's writing to the church at Philippi. Now, there won't be a quiz at the end of this session, but this city took its name from Philip II of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great. It was one of his military strongholds in northern Greece. His primary interest was mining for gold and silver in the region. According to ancient records, those mines produced an annual revenue of a thousand talents. Now fast forward a few hundred years and Philippi is conquered by the Romans in 31 BC. So. Paul is writing to Roman citizens. They spoke the Latin language. They wore the Roman dress. Their coins had Roman inscriptions. The city itself was patterned after Rome and it sat on the Via Ignatia, which was a major military road in the Roman Empire. Spiritually speaking, Philippi had a wide variety of religious influences. There were altars to Greek gods. Archaeologists have found sanctuaries to the Egyptian gods Iris and Serapis. And of course, there were monuments to the Caesars. The imperial cult, as it was called, was the official state religion. Then, you've got this Jewish community that is living in Philippi. It was probably a small number because as far as we know, there was no synagogue in Philippi. If there had been, Paul probably would have gone there. Instead, Paul ends up on the outside of the city where he finds a small group praying on a riverbank. And that's where I want to Duresh. I want to rewind all the way to Acts chapter 16. The book of Acts is the backstory to most of the letters that Paul writes, including this one. Again, he's not writing to strangers. He can see their faces and they can hear his voice. And you can feel the affection in verses 3 through 8. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains 
or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. This is a love letter. In fact, it's a love fest. Paul's affection for the Philippians is palpable, tangible, visceral. Now, if Paul took the Myers-Briggs, I'm guessing he would have been more of a thinker than a feeler. But of all the letters Paul writes, this may be the most emotional. There is this deep-seated feeling in his writing. He's looking back on their shared history from the first day until now. And it's this flash flood of memories. What memories? Well, I'm glad you asked. Paul is referencing what was recorded in Acts 16. Paul is on his second missionary journey, and Philippi was not on the itinerary. Philippi wasn't plan A, it was plan B. It wasn't a destination, it was a detour. Acts 16, 6 says, the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. God closes the door to Bithynia, and at the time, it must have seemed like a setback. Someday, I think we'll thank God for the closed doors as much as the open doors. What we see as a detour is often a redirection. That night, Paul has a vision of a man in Macedonia pleading for him to come. Verse 10 says, so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Long story short, Paul takes the gospel to Europe, and his first stop is the city of Philippi. He finds a group of Jews outside the city praying by a river. One of them is a woman named Lydia, who is a commodities trader, a merchant of expensive purple cloth. Fun fact, the color purple derives from the inky secretion of a sea snail called Hexaplex trunculus. It took about 10,000 snails to produce one gram of purple dye. At one point in history, an ounce of purple was worth more than an ounce of gold. Lydia becomes the first convert to Christianity on the continent of Europe. She gets baptized along with other members of her household. This is a tipping point, a turning point. This is the day when decades happen. The gospel has a foothold in Philippi. As Paul writes this letter, He's having flashbacks to this defining moment and a few others that are recorded in Acts 16. One day, as Paul was going to the place of prayer, they meet a girl who is demon-possessed. She was trolling them, baiting them, heckling them. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turns around and commands the demon to come out of her. Now, at some point, enough is enough, right? Whatever you tolerate will eventually dominate. All the enemy wants is a foothold. Give the enemy an inch and he will take a mile. At some point, you've got to turn around and confront the issue. You've got to exercise your authority. You've got to flip the script. And that's what Paul does. But there's a catch. Acts 16, 16 says, she was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. Listen, when you start messing with people's finances, it's about to get real up in here. The entire city ends up in an uproar. Paul and Silas are stripped and beaten and thrown into jail. They end up in the inner dungeon with their feet clamped in stocks. All of that to say this, Paul is writing this letter from prison, but it's not the first time. 
Paul found himself in and out of prison multiple times on his missionary journeys, including Philippi. Acts 16, 25 says that around midnight, they fell asleep. No, that's not what it says. Around midnight, they started complaining to each other. Nope. It says around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. Paul and Silas could have thrown a pity party, right? They were being obedient to the vision God had given them and it lands them in jail. They could have played the victim card, but instead of complaining about their circumstances, they give God the sacrifice of praise. Listen to me. The hardest praise is the highest praise. It's worshiping God when you don't feel like it. It's worshiping God when things don't go your way. It's worshiping God in tough circumstances, in tough times. I can only imagine the scene inside this prison. The other prisoners have to be wondering who is singing and why. They, they may even be a little miffed, right? It's around midnight, but Paul and Silas are not thermometers. They are thermostats and they shift the atmosphere inside this prison with their praise. Let me end session one with a challenge. Here it is, prophesy your praise. Gratitude is great. It's thanking God after he does it. But sometimes you need to exercise your faith and praise God before he does it. That's what Paul and Silas do. And look at what happens. Their praise causes an earthquake that results in a jailbreak. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Why? Because you never know what God may do. If you do the right thing day in and day out, God might just show up and show off. The jailer ends up getting baptized in the middle of the night. Then he invites Paul and Silas over to his house for a meal. The next day, they are set free by the city officials. They meet with the believers at Lydia's house and they wave goodbye. As Paul pens this letter that we call Philippians, there are moments that fire across his synapses. These are the memories that flood his heart with hope and love. It starts with vision. The vision of a man in Macedonia. Paul is obedient to that vision. It ends up in a prayer meeting outside of Philippi and it turns into a divine appointment that has a domino effect. Throw in an earthquake and a miraculous jailbreak. And all of that is a prologue to this letter called Philippians. That's where we'll pick it up in session two. In the meantime, prophesy your praise. That's how we shift the atmosphere. That's how we change the temperature. That's how we set the tone, set the table, and set the stage for what God wants to do next.